In biblical times, Israel was sometimes called the land of the gazelle. The mountain gazelle symbolized love, liberty, grace. It became the emblem of the Jewish people. When Israelis came once more to live and farm on the Golan Heights, they reintroduced mountain gazelles, which had been wiped out by hunting a century or more earlier. Once more, gazelles danced on the high places, danced and multiplied, until today, Israel has a problem which no one had foreseen, a national emblem which has become a pest. In the ruins of the palace built by the Sultan Hisham near Jericho, a mosaic floor from the 8th century depicts the gazelle of Israel falling prey to the Arab lion, as indeed it had a century earlier. Now the gazelle is back, with a vengeance. The artist knew very well the gazelle's feeding habits. Gazelles breed all the year round, with a main peak in the autumn, but spring is a time of considerable activity. A territorial male will mate with as many females as he can defend from other males, sometimes as many as 50. The fights are ritualized, but the stakes are very high. The contest will be decided by a combination of weight and strength. A few brief horn-to-horn -horn contacts are usually enough to let each contestant know where he stands. Although he is sexually mature at one year old, a male cannot breed until he is strong enough to win and hold a territory, which may not be until he is three years old. Horning plants and urinating are ways of marking the boundary. Any male which drops out of the competition for any reason, whether it's old age, injury or death, will be replaced immediately. The best place to defend is a wide open space with plenty of food where the females gather in the largest groups and a male can see a rival coming from far away. A female can mate at the age of about seven months and again about 10 days after she has given birth. In good conditions, she can produce nearly two fawns every year, certainly three in two years. From 400 animals introduced in 1970, the gazelle population in the southern Golan Heights is now rising past four and a half thousand. Three thousand of them are females. One thing against which even the strongest male has no defense is the bulldozer. As more and more of the Golan is taken over for agriculture, the gazelles can only keep out of the way and watch their food supply being pushed aside. But the bulldozer produces wide open fields with all the rocky hillocks leveled. A male gazelle can control a huge territory in such a perfect breeding arena. Corn, tomatoes and grazing for cattle form a nutritious diet. On the lower slopes, groves of fruit trees offer an appetizing supplement. The farmer's improvements have improved the lot of the gazelles. Another improvement for the gazelles arises from the farmer's concern for their stock. The Golan Heights have a varied population of predators, including jackals, which the farmers accuse of killing calves. 
It's equally likely that the jackals are scavenging stock which died of natural causes. But to pacify the farmers, rangers from the Nature Reserve's authority hunt jackals at night when they're most active. In fact, jackals may be the principal predators on gazelles. By shooting them, the authority is protecting or even boosting the gazelle population. The ranger's nightly patrols reveal that the Golan Heights, part of which is a nature reserve, has recovered very well from the devastation of overhunting by its former inhabitants and from the war which displaced them. Wild boar are very common, even though they are enthusiastically hunted by both Arabs and Israelis. Porcupines are regularly seen at night, though they spend the day in hiding. Wildcats are scarce over most of Israel, but quite common here. The fox is the same species as is found in Europe, but here it is regarded neither as a pest nor as a noble quarry species. It is principally a scavenger, tidying up the carcasses of gazelles and other animals which die of natural causes. The fox is no match for the hyena, an altogether heavier class of scavenger. As the foxes disconsolately watch their dinner being removed, they might at least be thankful that they're not tarred to the same brush as the jackals. Slaughter of the jackals protects the gazelle at the most vulnerable point in its life cycle, the first month. The mother goes off alone to give birth so that her fawn will be hidden from view. Feral dogs are another threat which she must guard against. When it's born, the fawn is helpless, its only defense the ability to hide and to lie perfectly still until its mother comes to suckle it. It keeps alert for danger, but only so that it will not be startled into sudden movement. Lying still in the grass, it becomes invisible. A family of woodchat shrikes benefits from the abundant insect life of high summer. For the first three or four weeks of its life, the fawn stays within an area about 30 meters across, waiting patiently to be fed and groomed by its mother. The extraordinary thing is that 65% of the fawns survive to the end of their first year. If there were more predators about, that figure would be much lower. When the fawn is about a month old, it will follow its mother everywhere she goes. She will defend a small, movable feeding territory for the two of them, wandering far and wide in search of the best places. For the time being, though, the fawn stays put. A 
At this time of year, the bachelor males are separated from the rest in their own herd. The breeding males defend their territories, mating with any females which come into season as they pass through. Within 10 or 15 days of giving birth, the mother will be pregnant again. Until she dies at eight years old, barring accidents, she will produce a steady stream of fawns every seven or eight months, producing milk to feed them from her rich diet of corn shoots and selected grasses in the pastures so conveniently planted for her by the long-suffering farmers. The farmers have tried driving the gazelles away, even shooting some, which is illegal, since the gazelle is a protected species. But they keep on coming back. Fencing is one answer, but it's very expensive to set up, beyond the reach of most farmers. For those who can afford to put up fences, they make quite a difference, evidently offering just enough of an inconvenience to persuade the gazelles to feed elsewhere. The results can be seen when the crop ripens. By now it's late summer, the driest part of the year, a hard time even for these hardy animals. There's food to be had, but not of the same quality as they've been getting. At this time of year, the gazelles feed mainly on dry stems, and especially seeds, together with the fruits and leaves of spiny shrubs. Where they can reach them, they browse from trees. You can tell gazelle country at a glance, like those in English parks. Its trees have a clear browse line just above the animal's head height. Even during this dry season, the mothers produce plenty of milk to suckle their fawns. shrikes have a new range of insect prey. Ant lions have emerged from their predatory larval form for a short life on the wing. They're a tricky mouthful for a young shrike. All wings with a tiny piece of meat attached. Among the seeds of summer is one variety which does the gazelles no good. They're colored by immersion in a seed dressing which poisons mice which dig them up. Gazelles are colorblind and they don't find the seeds by digging them up. They are put in danger by a conspiracy of ants. The ants collect seeds during the dry season for food. They drag, heave and maneuver them to the entrance to their nest and thence underground. Gazelles have exploited these opportune collections of seeds for thousands of years as a food supply which appears just when they need it most. Unfortunately, it is now a death trap rather than a lifeline. But the food chain must go on, and above there are always the vultures. Scavengers of all kinds come into their own in the dry season, when the mountain burns every year. The fires are man-made to improve the grazing, but the result is to produce a heavy stress on all the wild animals, as their food supply, such as it was, goes up in smoke.
The aftermath of the fire is a desolate landscape with plenty of food for scavengers, but little to offer a grazing animal. A few scorched seeds are all the gazelles can find. A Syrian woodpecker, however, can feed its chick with its first cooked meal. For the gazelles, the time has come to look for another source of food. They leave the burned out hillsides to move lower down, where mankind, as has become its habit in recent years, supplies their need. They move quietly by night among the haunts of man, helped by a group of wild boars, which conveniently lift the fence which the fruit grower thought would be his insurance. Grapefruit saplings and young citrus trees of all kinds are exactly to the gazelle's taste. When he has eaten, a young buck leaves his card. Driven from the mountain by fire and famine, and by the ever-increasing pressure of their own population, the gazelles are an irresistible force which the fruit growers have come to resent. No sooner are their trees planted than they are wrecked and have to be replaced. The fruit growers and farmers joined forces to appeal to the nature reserve's authority to do something before they took the law into their own hands. They made it clear that they would not suffer this continued threat to their livelihood from any animal, no matter how protected or emblematic. The authorities set up a research program which lasted for four years, studying ways of attacking the problem. While they waited, the fruit growers tried everything and anything to protect themselves. A well-known brand of soap has been said to deter gazelles from molesting mangoes. The farmers tried it. Some said it worked, but nobody could say why. The soap manufacturers saw their sales rise, but said nothing. Finally, with all the evidence in, the authority decided that for two experimental years they would wage war on the gazelles to cut down their population to a manageable size. They sold licenses to local hunters and set a quota of 2,000 animals for the first year to be killed between November and March in selected areas on one hunting day each week. Unlike most Israelis, Arabs have a long tradition of hunting. The response was enthusiastic. Gazelle meat is worth nearly four times as much as beef, so the hunters were keen to get what they could. The first permits were for one male and two females for each hunter but most of the hunters shoot on sight without much regard for the gender of their quarry. Also, males have more impressive horns, which look good on the front of the jeep on the way home, even if they are tougher than females. The result of the hunts was that males and females were killed in roughly equal numbers.
By tradition, animals for eating are put to death with a knife. So the hunters do not shoot to kill, but to immobilize. Gazelle hunting is a bloody business. Research by the Nature Reserve's authorities showed that to reduce the population, the hunter should be killing four females for every male. In addition, there should be some permanent division between the cultivated land and the remaining wilderness. By straying onto agricultural land, the gazelles were not only eating crops and wrecking fruit trees, they were spreading foot and mouth disease as well. The scientist who led the research, a long-term student of gazelles, is Dr. Dan Bacharav. He is disturbed by the idea of hunting his favorite animal, but sees it as the only way. Bacharav's computer model revealed that the problem lies with the females, relentlessly fertile and permanently pregnant. Unless they can be drastically reduced in number, the population will continue to grow. Shooting males is a waste of ammunition, except for the hunters because there are always so many waiting in the wings for their turn to take over a territory. The hunting is to continue for a few more years. It helps a little, and the income from the sale of licenses will be spent on future research into the gazelle problem. But the problem is not solved. It's partly a question of manpower and therefore of money which neither the government nor the farmers can spare. The Arab hunters are the principal beneficiaries from the curious problem of Israel's national animal. Fences are expensive and ineffectual. Hunting is only marginally effective in controlling the gazelle's numbers. Yet the mayhem of 16 hunting days each spring keeps the farmers from destroying every gazelle in sight. The predators could do more to control the population, but if they return in sufficient numbers, they will be accused of taking the farmer's stock, not gazelles. The more land the farmers cultivate, the happier and more fruitful the gazelles will be. To the people of the cities, the gazelle may be an emblem of all their country stands for, but to the farmers and the conservationists, it's a problem as thorny as any that ever tested the wisdom of Solomon.